to the first ever Cold Pop podcast. It is my exceptional pleasure today to have Boron, a hacker, a math nerd, an ex colleague, and a friend. He is also an author of three books and a functional programming aficionado. Welcome, Boron. Thank you for the great introduction. It's a pleasure to be present here at the first Cold Pop podcast ever, and I'm looking forward to many more podcasts in the future. All right. We'd be happy to provide more in the future again. So, let's first talk origins. How did you get into programming in the first place? Yes, so <clears throat> I think it starts usually as most of us, probably. I don't want to generalize a lot, but I would say for me, um, it started with video games as usual. So, there were two main drivers in my life, which kind of led me to where I am right now. I want to believe that those two are the most important. Uh, the one driver is me having access to a computer, thanks to my dad, uh, which was also, and he's still also working with computers to this day. Uh, so this means even from my youngest ages, I had that, this access to, which I consider a privilege. And then the other driver is uh, genuine curiosity into things and just trying to understand how things work and why they work that way and uh, just getting a general uh, sense. So, uh, like I said, it started with video games. At this time, I think the two main, of the two main drivers, only one of them was present, which is access to a computer. The second driver came a bit later, so I was only, you know, this little kid who was just interested in... Uh, computers just seemed like this magical device that you could do stuff with it. So, there is this game which I remember uh, even to this day, uh, it's called Crystal Caves from Apogee Software, and it's like this 2D platformer. And this, I, I, as far as I can remember, this was my first game that I ever started playing on uh, on my uh, X86 machine, I believe it was, uh, some Pentium, uh, at the age of three. Uh, so it's like this little guy that throws out, that fires rockets, has this lo rocket launcher that you know you can use to defeat enemies and whatever. And I think this is where it uh, all began. Yeah, that's a common story. Most of us started off that way. That's true. So you did mention a computer. What was that first computer you used? I believe it was some. I I don't. I do not remember the technical details exactly because I was just like this little kid who still didn't, you know, just like the the, the curiosity came a bit later. Like I said, and at this point in my life, me being three years old. You are just like this little kid who sees some graphics on the on the screen and just like presses the buttons and something happens and this is like the wow moment mo moment that you that you kind of like uh, appreciate a lot. But uh, at the same time, at that time, I was not really interested into how what 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 is this what 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 is this computer what what does it have inside like what what are the specs and so I I, I for sure know it was some. 286 or perhaps even 386 so this was back in um, 91 92 so maybe somebody can correct me if I'm wrong but I, I believe it was like 286 at that time right so okay how did you actually got into programming what was your first programming language yeah it's a very good question I think uh, there was a natural progression from video games to programming uh, and the most interesting bit is that I really have not started programming before actually um, tackling crackers and trainers they were called like that back then so a trainer is basically like this software that allows you like let's say you're playing some game that you have like a uh, thousand coins and you need th i don't know two thousand coins to to buy this weapon or whatever so a trainer is a is a, is a special program that what it does is uh, attaches to the game process and it's uh, modifying the memory values of the of the game itself so uh, you don't have to do any work in the game you just like launch this application and suddenly you have like all the money uh, you need to make the progress in the game so this was uh, one of the steps in the progression that that uh, took place um so cracking and trainers you know like those groups back then i don't know razor 1911 uh fairlight or wh whoever they are um it's like then it combined with chip tunes and all of this stuff like this blip blop music you, you listen and it's what really felt magical to me at the time so um 
before starting into programming, I was really interested in okay how these trainers work, right? Um, so I, I, you know, you just and, and of, of course, you know, you, you cannot understand these things like before you actually get into programming. Um, so the first programming language I would say, as far as I can remember, is Quick Basic. Um, and to relate to what I was saying earlier, uh, there was this game, uh, I think it was Monopoly or something, where in Quick Basic you just like have the source, co the source, the whole source code of the game, and what you can do is modify the code, and then you actually affect the game, and you can give yourself money or whatever. So it started with Quick Basic, but it wasn't like any special kind of building rockets, uh, rocket ships or whatever. It's, it was more like I have this source code, I have this game, I'm just gonna give myself more money. And, you know, that's that's how it started, all of it. Nice, nice. So that's kind of nostalgic for me as well, because we're a similar age, so... Uh, what were the games you did uh, use trainers and stuff like that for the most part? This is on a tangent, but still, I think it's relevant to the story. Yeah, it's a very good question. Uh, as far as I can remember, the first game that I used a trainer for is StarCraft by uh, Blizzard entertainment so starcraft is like this role-playing game where you where you are like this um, general so to say and you have a lot of units that you can control uh, but it also has resources like minerals and gas and at some point you know uh, and this is so before the, the you know this is before the time where um, uh, playing online was even uh, possible where we live because the internet was really slow at the time um, and so um, I, would, I was just gonna you know, play a game against the computer, and I'm saying to myself, okay, now the computer beats me, and it beats me again, and it beats me again. So you don't try to, you know, as a kid, you you you, you kind of uh, try to 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 get around the game by by not doing the the things that you're supposed to do, but by doing the easiest thing, right? So you're not actually learning the game, and you you don't want to learn the game and become better at it, but you just want to beat the computer at no cost, at whatever cost. So. I remember this trainer was probably by Rezor 1919 or and it just gives you infinite minerals and gas. And at this point, you just like launch the application and you build like all of your army with, you know, soldiers, or tanks, whatever. And you just like smash the computer. And this gives, I mean, used to give uh, this sense of um, accomplishment back then. Uh, but you're really cheating the game. I mean, it's not how the game is supposed to be played uh, but it's it's what got me started yeah another nostalgia point for razer one nine one nine one one and that those guys had like the best chip tunes ever i really loved the music of those crackers and stuff that was yes. awesome so let's shift gears to your professional career or rather let's get started with your studying experience did you actually get a diploma before starting up as a professional programmer do, do you have any formal education what's the story there yeah uh, so like uh, to continue the natural, natural progression uh, talk i think you know after trainers and crackers and whatnot um, i remember there was this irc channel on um, the fnet network so fnet was this like crazy network of full of hackers and whatnot you could find a lot of stuff there there were a lot of irc networks back then but you know like uh, most of them were just like for example undernet was really just for trolling and chilling around <laughs> but fnet was really this um, educational network that i have to say and Ad admit that I learned a lot of stuff there and like I said it started with crackers and trainers but uh, really so there were these two channels on FNET I don't know if they still exist one of them was cracking for newbies and then the other one was new to cracking and you would join this channel and people just talk a lot of random stuff like hexadecimal codes I don't know uh, win API uh, functions that you can use to attach to a process uh, modifying memory, creating self, um, cre creating an executable that self modifies its, um, and all of these sort of tricks. And I'm like, I don't understand anything of this, you know. Uh, so it, it, at this time, I don't remember. I still had like the the will to 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 start learning programming, but it was just like this. Probably at this time is when genuine curiosity started to kick in. So I'm like. Okay, I just want to figure out what this is, you know, I, I want to understand it, that's it. Uh, and I, eventually I want to write a trainer myself, so 
Uh, these two channels from Fnet provided with me uh, that experience for me, which is, you know, uh, there were a lot of tutorials uh, by Exilion, um, I don't remember, Fravia, Orc, there are a lot of like famous names that I, I, I have co completely forgotten most of them by, by now, but um, I'm getting to your question, uh, which is, so, right, uh, when this happens, I'm like 13 or 14 years old, right, and in basic school and in high school, uh, the educational system here was you know, uh, you you write this basic program, which is really you just read the book and you just write the same contents as it is in the book in, in, in the computer and then something draws. But that's, that's as far as education went. And in high school, I think it was more like uh, Microsoft Office packages, uh, you know, learning how to use a browser. So I was like already uh, beyond those stuff because I was, you know, continuously involved with computers. So... Um, I want to attribute like the first starting experience to the Fnet network, which is learning how to crack and write trainers. And then uh, in high school, something happened, which is the teacher, like, you know, she's teaching other kids, other students, how to use a browser or whatever. And then she sees me and she notices something probably that, I mean, teachers are probably good at that, <laughs> you know, trying to see like trying to, to find who's who, who who is different from the others and then she's like well you know i think you have a very good understanding of computers what do you think about that and i'm like well you know i spend most of my time on the computer so yeah probably i don't know so there is this competitive uh, programming uh, that's happening for high school students are you interested in it and i'm like I have no idea what is what it is, you know, I don't know what uh, CPE's uh, competitive programming really is. Uh, so I'm like, yeah, well, why not, you know, I'm, she, she was like something, so, you know, you don't have to attend other classes, you know, this will be your, your, your reward for it. And I'm like, really? So, so, awesome. yeah. <laughs> so I can, you know, I can go to school and just do computers. Yes, that will be the same thing for like a couple of weeks. And I'm like, I don't care about CPE's, I, I don't care about anything. It's computers, just, you know, I'm, I'm in it. And then she's like, okay, you know, so, so she signs me up. She, she was basically my mentor, so to say. And then in this uh, competitive, um, so this was another highlight of my, um, you know, natural progression besides crackers and trainers is when you get to this competitive programming, it's like this really, now when I think of it, it's like this really high pressure kind of uh, environment where you, you know, you you just like sit and compete with other kids. You know, it's it's like you, you see them, you talk to them, you smile. But then when uh, all of you sit on the computer, you are like, I'm, I I want to crush you. You know, so you are like this uh, egoistic little kid that just wants to be best at everything. So um, this is the other you know highlight, like I said, where I started to to learn how uh, you know how to program how to program fast the, the, the tasks were most mostly algorithmic so but it still gave me this sense of um okay you know uh, this is what programming is about it, it's and, and and this is what you know um uh, you you will be doing for the rest of your life and i'm like well it's high pressure but i really enjoyed this um you know i i, I won several several prizes but regardless of that it's just that I want to continue doing this and you know and then um, uh, I actually started so this is high school right and then uh, after high school um, I started working uh, professionally this is in 2010 for a uh, company here which at this time I don't have like a university degree or whatever it's just like borrow with his high school diplomas from uh, from the competitive programming um, uh, I think that was organized. So I'm like, you know, uh, I need some money. Uh, it's uh, it's this period in, in my life where I needed some money and I'm like, you know, I'm just going to start programming. And uh, I, I have a general idea of what programming is, but, you know, when you start working in a company, it's very unlike competitive programming. And uh, I have to admit I'm happy for that because I at this age, I don't know if I uh, enjoy high pressure as much as back then. Yeah. 
like competitive programming and professional programming are like entirely different sports. I can like easily agree to that. Yeah, and uh, so uh, I, I forgot to also mention one important thing about all of this progression is I, I'm leaning towards you know uh, your 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 initial question is most of my stuff is uh, things that I have learned uh, you know self self learning. Um, but also there was another big thing which uh, is also can be attributed to my parents which we had an internet cafe for 11 years and or 12 years something like that and uh, it's it was this period like 99 until 2011 or something like that where internet cafes were the thing you know and yeah. a huge a huge amount of my knowledge also comes from there where you just do stuff and break stuff and you have like this support from your parents you know i don't know hey dad i broke the cpu cooler from this computer you know oh okay at least you tried fixing it here's some money get a new cooler and you know assemble it uh, and you know I, at that time i didn't feel like it's something uh you know that that would turn later turn out to be useful in in my life, but you you really realize that uh, these small things are basically the you know what what caused these these large shifts. Um, and speaking of school, I I was really bad at most subjects except for mathematics and informatics, obviously. Um, but uh, again, I had this luck from from the competitive program where all of my grades were sort of uh, quote unquote fixed. <laughs> uh, because you know uh, I spent all of my time studying for the for the competitions um, but yeah university degree came a lot later after after the professional uh, after I started started working professionally cool so I know that it's sort of a spoiler I know you're currently into academia at least partially but yeah we'll get into that later <laughs> I don't need to drill down into that just now so, yeah, past that point, we actually, well, I actually had the pleasure of working with you for a while, and it was a fun time back then. What's the most important, uh, or rather the most interesting uh, part of that collaboration that we had together? Yes, uh, this is a very good question. Just going to give an extra context here. Um, so my first job was really actually working at an... Like this outsourcing company that a lot of random projects come in, like, I don't know, Java, C Sharp, I, you know, Python, I don't know, whatever else. And I've been working there for like three years or something like that. But like I said, it's like this um, outsourcing slash corporate culture. Yeah. Uh, and so the company that you and I work together um, uh, is was my, actu my second job, actually. And the way it differed from the first job was that it's a startup, basically. So... Uh, really, uh, I had a very good experience there um, to be, you know, to, to feel the, 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 the beauty of working in a startup. Um, uh, I, I, have to, I have to tell the listeners that it was my first and my last startup, but uh, regardless of that, uh, so startups, um, I think they, so for sure they drain a lot of energy from you and you have to be like very enthusiastic and you, you, you just like have to find some source from which you drain this energy and you have to be prepared to waste all of your energy in there but the best part uh, working in a startup was I would say the freedom to move fast to research to experiment and do a lot of crazy stuff like I remember one specific collaboration uh, you and I that we had was we used Libaria, which is a library for uh, torrents, like peer-to-peer -peer, uh, data transfer, it doesn't have to be only files. And then so we built like this uh, browser plugin uh, based on the NP API. I think NP API was, uh, it's, it's uh, coming from Netscape, uh, the API, but I think it's obsolete by now. So it, it uh, died with Flash. And yeah, it's been sunsetted for sure, at least like six, seven-ish years ago, maybe more. Yeah, so, and this MP API, uh, you know, uh, you and I are just like sitting in this pub drinking some beer, and I remember, you know, you mentioning, hey, you know, we can speed up the, the MP API video player that you build, that you're building together with another co co-worker uh, by using, by integrating Libaria into it and trying to distribute the data. 
that is transferred for the video and audio to you know between between different uh, kind of viewers so it's like these small projects that you know you have the freedom to uh, you know to to experiment with it and it, it something will happen eventually but the thing with startup startups is that uh, most of the times nothing happens and um, you have to be very careful with how you you know uh, waste your energy there and make sure that you know especially I, I don't want to say pay pay attention to your mental health because i was very young at that time but if i were to work in a startup at this age uh, i'm 34 now um uh, uh, you know it would be very different for me definitely yeah i can agree to that sort of as a transition question how would you compare the startup grind culture versus the place you're currently working at in terms of like how they compare with uh, pressure speed expectations and so on yes uh it's a great question so um it's you know uh, so i'm, I'm working uh, for automatic right now i've been there for six years it's basically the company behind wordpress but there are also several other other products like um, woocommerce word um, tumblr uh, word ads jetpack so all of those things and uh, the interesting thing about automatic is uh, so i joined there six years ago when it was i think i was like employee number 500 something and right now you know uh, taking uh, you know uh, all the people that have left all the people that uh, all the new people that have joined uh, you know it's around 2000 people right now so it definitely grew a lot uh, in this past six years um and it's just it's a it's a it's a good question because automatic itself considers internally it considers itself as a startup which is funny um i would not call it a corporation but also i i would not call it an early startup as well i, I would say somewhere in between in that right so you have you still have the freedom to like introduce new processes and do changes and make impact uh you have this option but at the same time and there is chaos, of course, uh, but at the same time, you, uh, you you're not strictly uh, controlled or strictly bound by these processes, which most corporations tend to, you know, get get like themselves stuck. You know, so me, me working in a corporation, what I what I what I found out is that most of the processes that are there are just there for for the sake of a process and it's just like making things complex so uh and in startups most of the times you don't even have processes so right uh automatic is somewhere in between I, I like to think that um everybody can make a change to the process as long as it makes sense as long as it's debated and as long as it can be you know justified the decision um and at the same time it's uh, the chaos we, we try to give to bring some control to the chaos but i uh you know it's um not like it's it's unlike a startup and it's not like a corporation i i hope that answers the question <laughs> yeah it, it paints an interesting picture for sure now i'm going to switch gears to your current uh job description and you're not actually doing much programming these days are you i mean professionally yes uh yeah it's you know I, yeah i mean you know when you start asking questions like that it's it's like very uh very hard to give like precise answer because now we have to define what programming means uh, and i agree with you the definition of programming for me has quite changed uh in the past period for what's happened is so like i said six years at automatic uh the first four years were mostly product work um you know doing some research working on a product uh doing bug fixes security fixes whatever customers give you uh you know user stories you you address those you make customers happy and so something happened two years ago where uh, automatic has this culture of like role switches and i'm like you know um i get pinged by this random person that says hey you know we have like this role that you might be interested in maybe not but we just want to let you know that it's a thing uh it's basically for you to help us on the hiring part of hiring engineers right so i'm like wait hiring engineers what does that mean oh you know you 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 know people who apply are automatic you will talk to them you will work with them you you will evaluate them and i'm like 
So this is going to take three months. It's like a, you know, like a, they, they call it rotation internally. So three months and I'm like, but wait, you know, I, I don't know any of these things. Uh, I'm interested in it, but I don't know any of that, any of the things you mentioned. And the person was like, well, that's the point of the rotation uh, is for us to teach you. Nice. And, you know, I'm like, oh, this is getting better for sure. Uh, and so three months, I mean, you know, uh, so I do my, uh, you know, I, I hand off all the stuff that I'm working on, documentation, API, uh, finishing all the remaining work. And then, uh, you know, I'm like, okay, I'm just going to need like a week or two and then I can start three months and then I'm back in, in, into my previous team. Sure, sounds like a good idea. And then what happens is... Uh, the first three months is where you actually, we, we, we have like this, so like I said, you know, we have like these processes internally that are not strictly defined, but they have like their own freedom uh, in which, you know, so there was this process of, uh, of shadowing and most of the stuff in the first three months uh, was me mostly learning stuff. So it's not like I really evaluated any candidate or uh, interview or whatever, but it was mostly me being there shadowing and seeing what the other person does. And, you know, it's like this basically learn by doing or learn by watching. Uh, and, you know, and you repeat, uh, like what monkeys do, for example. <laughs> and so um, I'm like, you know, three months go by and I'm like, oh, you know, it's, you know, it's a lot of stuff I, I have, I have uh, absorbed. Uh, and what I do next is I just write like this reflection post. Um, we have like this uh, internal uh, blog posting mechanism at Automatic, which, you know, uh, depending on, uh, we, we have a lot of, uh, we ha a, a lot of uh, P2s where, you know, one P2 might be related to marketing research and other to code research, whatever. So uh, we have a P2 for hiring and then I'm writing like this reflection post. And as I'm writing it, I figure that Wait, so I learned all of this stuff as to, you know, what it means to evaluate a candidate. For example, you know, asking questions, asking the right questions. That that was my biggest, my biggest uh, gain, I would say, you know. Um, and then uh, if you ask this question, what response do you expect? And what information do you give with the very own question that you are uh, asking? That's one example, you know. Another example is... Um, evaluating their, uh, you know, the candidates' uh, research qualities or communication qualities. So what does it mean to even communicate? And, you know, it starts a bit getting into this, like, philosophy um, around, you know, programming and, w like what you said, you know, uh, do less programming but do more of the stuff that is about programming. So, right, you know, you know, you, you just, like, take a step back and you, you go on this meta level that you... Um, you say, okay, I'm not going to do programming, but I'm going to do stuff about programming. And so I'm um, like three months in the rotation. I did nothing productive here besides me learning. I want to stay more. I want to, I want to actually apply the stuff that I learned. Right. So you, you, you know, it's like you buy, a, I don't know, a shovel and then somebody teaches you how to use it. And then you're like, okay, you know, I'm selling this shovel. I, I know how to use it and that's it. But you really want to build a house, right? Um, so uh, uh, we decide internally that I should extend my rotation to another six months. And um, at this time is where you actually get to apply the, all the quote unquote theoretical part that you, that you learn. And practice is, you know, practice makes perfect. Um, and uh, this is where I realized, wait, I don't really want to go back to programming. I want to stay here and I want to be doing this. This is actually a really good driver for me. I'm learning a lot of new stuff. I'm, you know, working with people, uh, working with random people, um, seeing random solutions, trying to understand why people arrived with that solution. What were they thinking when they wrote all of this code? Uh, how could have then they done it differently? So all of these things kind of like, you know, it starts getting closer and closer to, to philosophy. And um, to this day, uh, we decided to stop the rotation and do like the full role switch. And yes, I'm now part of the developer experience at Automatic. We're still working with hiring, but also other stuff like um, uh, 
um, you know, tweaking internal processes, working on tooling, uh, developer mentorship. Uh, just started doing that a few weeks ago. Um, so yeah, I'm definitely still excited about the position, and I'm still learning, and so happy to be there. Glad to hear that, and that's an awesome transition to my next question, actually. Currently, DevEx and DevRel and all of the Dev star professions are sort of a hot topic. Uh, to you, what does DevEx mean? How would you describe it in, like, layman's terms, let's say? Yes, um, it's another good question. I would say um, my take of it is, I don't know if I can give a general definition of it, but my take on it is that uh, DevEx, DevRel, whatever you want to call it, is closely tied to the company culture, right? So uh, what I mean by this is every company has its own culture that they are trying to follow, like a mission statement or whatever. And I used to be very skeptical of those things when I was younger, like, you know, who is this BS or whatever. Um, but there is a lot of value in that, which once you define this, it will dictate most of the parts that will be happening in your company, right? For, so, for example, Automatic has this creed, which uh, it's a long creed, but one of the parts is communication is oxygen. So it means it really means that, you know, uh, Automatic, given it's a remote and distributed company um, with, you know, people working from all across the globe and our main tools are Slack and GitHub and Zoom. So if you cannot communicate, you know, n not not much can happen. So uh, back to the question, I think uh, DevEx uh, and how it relates actually to hiring, for example, at Automatic, we pay a lot of attention to how people communicate. And we also set the expectations and give them context around how we do it at Automatic. You know, obviously, you, 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 you cannot force a person to communicate this way or do that way or do this the other way. Uh, but we give them information in, as, uh, as for, you know, this is how things work at Automatic. So uh, this dictates, for example, the hiring process. Um, and then another part of the creed is I will never stop learning. So Automatic says something like, you know, uh, we will pay you a lot of money for your self-growth, for whatever. So uh, by nature, you know, this program of developer mentorship gets born. Um, and then it's really driven by the culture, right? So, um, I will never stop learning is basically the developer mentorship, which is still under the umbrella of uh, DevEx. So, um, to, sh to, to, give a, to give a short answer, I think, uh, don't pay attention to a, lo a lot. Uh, I mean, obviously, you know, it's all about people and about computers, De DevX and DevRel. Uh, like you wrote on your one of your blog posts that, uh, you know, developer relations. Uh, but uh, at the same time, if you want to get closer to what it really means to be doing DevRel is start at the top, which is uh, the company culture and then you know, go go bottom to the to the to the atom to the atom level to the unit level, which is basically the programmer and the employees. And in my understanding, DevEx and DevRel, what they do is they sort of uh, bring bring the culture. They, they, they are like this law enforcement of culture. <laughs> I, I I don't want to use the word enforcement. I think it's a too hard of uh, you know too harsh for word, but. Um, something that would give uh, other people, uh, you know, they, uh, you, you know. So what happens is usually programmers they are like in this everyday cycle where they program, code, test, review, QA, repeat, and it's very easy to forget what company is it you're working for, what are your options for self growth, all of those stuff. So. I think there needs to be someone there to, to like what, what you know what got me here right to the to the hiring rotation is I got pinged I it was a thing in automatic but I was so busy with my day to day activities that I'm like you know I, I don't know what else uh, you know what what options automatic gives so like DevEx DevRel to me is where you know some there there are a group of people that take the culture and you know j they just like try to spread it among the on, among the people and you know like this is this is the like, like when you go to a new city and visit you know you pay attention to the architecture to the culture um, but you do that on, on purpose when you're when you're a tourist but um, uh, devex is like this tourist guide for for the company Th this is my take on it 
Cool, cool. Okay, that's an interesting take. That would easily describe like what, for the most part, internal devils do, and I do agree with that definition. It's interesting that you mentioned tourism and tourists because you recently had a sabbatical. And can you tell us more about what a sabbatical is and how they work inside Automatic? Yes. Um, so yeah, I start working uh, professionally in 2010, and my first sabbatical was. Uh, 2022, which is this year, and now uh, what happens is in uh, so right uh, from the start and to the point before the sabbatical, uh, the longest period I was away from computers was probably like a week or two at most, and in those two weeks you probably just go somewhere I don't know, um, uh, you know like summer break, uh, go to the sea or whatever, but. Uh, you know, uh, you, you always take your computer. I, I always take my computer with me, and uh, it's it's definitely a break where you can, you know, uh, get, get away from your day-to-day -day activities for sure. But uh, you are still with a computer, and then uh, after a couple of days, you even you you, you start getting away from the computer. But then uh, the two weeks are over, and you you are back to your day-to-day -day job activities. So uh, two weeks is it's a good time to decompress and that's it i would say uh it doesn't really give you the time to reflect which which i'm getting to to the point is so uh, what is a sabbatical in terms of automatic a sabbatical means that for every five years you spend at the company uh you get three months uh paid time off so i took my sabbatical uh this year um uh several months after I had already uh, got to the five-year uh, point mark, but I was, you know, aligning it with the summer break. So I, you know, didn't, didn't want to take the sabbatical and sit at home during the winter and do nothing. Uh, so it gave me a lot of stuff, uh, the sabbatical. Uh, of course, the first thing that, you know, before, even before it started is was the fear of, you know, missing out, fear of forgetting stuff. Uh, fear of getting out of shape, obviously. You, you think, you, you know, it's like you 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 are in this in this cycle where you just like keep rolling and rolling and rolling, but suddenly you have to stop and you're like, wait, can I can I still you know get back into the cycle as easy? So this was the biggest fear. And then what happened is first two weeks of of the sabbatical, still working on the computer, doing random stuff, um, you know, implementing a programming language. Probably can get to that. Uh, a bit later, uh, playing with stuff, and then something happened. Like after two or three weeks, is and this is you know I, I, I as I'm reflecting, I open my GitHub profile after uh, most of my stuff is on GitHub and even automatic most of automatic stuff is on GitHub. And after the sabbatical ended, I'm opening my GitHub and I see like this huge gap of three months minus that these two weeks where you know, and uh, but. It gives you this opportunity to step back and think, uh, which is, I think, very valuable lesson for me. And it's actually what gotten me to start reading more about philosophy. Uh, I'm reading my third philosophy book this year, right now, uh, which is uh, a, a direct direct consequence of the, of the sabbatical. And... Um, it's you know, I, I'm not even talking about those like basic things like you know like being rejuvenated with energy going back with full energy I, I think those are like the usual stuff but for me what happened is the reflection moment and thinking about things and just like trying to understand what I did where I am right now um, uh, going out uh, spending more time drinking beers with you and other friends philosophizing on a lot of different topics on a lot of different stuff uh, getting deeper into philosophy as I said try to understand like you know uh, you know like uh, formal systems for example their their limits trying to understand the, the purpose of life uh, you know the essence of one a person and all of those questions are like you know if you are used to doing computers a long time it's like you solve these problems, most of them have, have easy answers, like, you know, like, I don't know, you know, write program computer, uh, computer program that sums the first 100 digits. So this is an easy problem. And most of the stuff we are working on a day-to-day -day basis is, you know, unless you are in some, I don't know, uh, 
heavy academy environment or whatever but most of us are just like doing a web development you know like this um building apis integrating with apis and all of these problems have easy solutions but then you get into philosophy and you're like so you're first you're used to to coming up with easy solutions to problems but then philosophy comes and breaks everything right so it's um i think this reflection was one of my biggest um uh, uh, take from the sabbatical and obviously you know uh, spent a little time traveling around uh, France and Greece and other countries with my family spending more time with family definitely uh, you know uh, it, it's, uh, it's it's definitely valuable for me and th this is my, my, my sort of my uh, source of energy I, I want to call it like that cool good to know so you mentioned programming languages and that you actually authored one and for a fact i know that that's probably one of your current favorite topics to talk about so would you like to tell us a bit more about it yes uh so i think this goes back to, to the to the genuine interest that i mentioned earlier and uh sort of what happened after this genuine interest in high school is i started getting more and more interested into mathematics and how it relates to computers and so um one of the biggest uh i, I think one one of the so I, I remember one specific situation with you in our in our startup that we worked together was uh, we were outside drinking coffee and then you you say something like hey there is like this uh, you know very mathematical programming language that is crazy everybody's talking about it and at this time i already have the interest for for mathematics so it's already like you know there but um uh stepping into haskell uh like i think yeah it's two, 10 years already now at this point so stepping into haskell gave me this sort of um connection between mathematics and programming and sort of brought them closer together compared to i don't know you know um, python or whatever i mean one can argue it's all about mathematics but uh, with haskell i really felt like it's it's there so uh, you know lambda calculus type systems it sort of like naturally progressed from there um the first book uh, which is dependent types introduction to dependent types with idris idris is uh uh, very close to Haskell, but it has this support for dependent types, which is a more advanced typing mechanism. So uh, this is, you know, what, what started. And now to get to your question, um, I think this was the starting point where I actually am more interested into getting deeper into different programming languages and try to understand what are the trade-offs advantages and disadvantages of each programming language what, what you know for example haskell versus idris i don't know or python versus haskell or you know dynamic type languages i i i, I think it started back then and then you know sort of got a little bit into scheme which is a dialect of lisp and uh, it's just like all of these languages you, you start after a while you know after you learn um, you know you, you play around with them basically um, as a hobby it, that that's how it was for me you learn like there there are like these very basic primitives that allows you to build like you know crazy crazy stuff really like you know like uh, for example haskell is based on the on the type lambda calculus which is a very simple formal system which allows you to kind of like build very complex solutions and when you compare that to python or c or c++ there is there this doesn't seem to be like this core uh principles or core primitives that that kind of drive the language it's like this huge monster with that has no start and no end and you're like I'm just doing stuff. I don't know. You know, it works. I know it works. I, I have learned it by rote memory, sort of doing it mechanically. But with, with Haskell, I think I got to the point where this is how mathematics get uh, related to programming. Uh, it's sort of like, uh, you know, uh, brought the, the bridges, uh, two bridges together. And uh, yes, so uh, authoring a programming language is uh, came as a, as a, you know like you, you play with a lot of different programming languages and then obviously you know you, you just like take random stuff from each one of them and then you just try to to you know to uh, come up with something new and uh, interesting uh, at least for myself so uh 
the uh, the budge is basically a pair of uh, a programming language and a theorem prover so it's basically two languages in one so the programming language is very minimal in that it has um uh the uh, fractran for example is another programming this is where i got the the idea from uh, to using budge fractran is a programming language that uh, uses uh, prime numbers to encode and uh, decode registers, right? So, for example, um, you know, 3 to the power of 1 and 5 to the power uh, of 2, uh, 3 is the first prime number, 5 is the second prime number, these, these uh, 3 to the power of 1, 5 to the power of 2 says that register number one has value one and register number two has a value two. So you, you get, you learn this concept and you're like, wait, you know, I can just take like a random huge number and encode a lot of different information in it. So for example, you know, um, registers like there are in the in the in the processor or like you know there are on the tape of a Turing machine so Fractran was really was really you know Budge PL is very close to Fractran in that it has a much simpler syntax and uh, but Fractran was the was the driver for it and then Budge TP which is the theorem prover uh, is sort of based on Prolog and another programming language called Metamath but it, you know, sort of takes something out of Prolog and takes something out of Metamath, and it's like uh, like a different language in its own. Like Prolog, for example, has this um, notion of doing um, tree traversal and then you know backtrack. So it kind of does stuff does stuff for you magically, automatically. But uh, Budge TP, for example, doesn't have that. So you have to like sort of guide it, and it, you know, uh, for for it to prove any mathematical theorems. Right, right. That's cool. Since you mentioned like the experimental nature of what you're doing, I would like to also ask you about Kika and your membership and membership and involvement in there. Yes, so Kika is really special to me because, um, you know, it's like this place where you meet with a lot of different people that sort of are hobbyists like yourself. And, uh, you know, like, so my life, my, my computer life, I don't, don't want to say all of the life, but the computer life is sort of like divided into two main parts. The first part is your regular job and the things that you must do and have to do. And then the other part is like this sort of freedom to express kind of like the artistic version, um, which is do whatever is interesting, you know, try to understand how, uh, I don't know, like um, the Linux kernel works or try to understand... Uh, you know, uh, the Win API or whatever library it is that is interesting, or try to write a driver for, uh, you know, something uh, like webcam, or try to implement your own, uh, you know, sort of like file system, like FAT32. Or... So the, the artistic way is uh, like my main second driver, which was, you know, uh, of course, the regular uh, regular job is, is a driver as well, because, you know, you sort of like learn a lot of stuff there. But the artistic version also has a lot of values in that um, you sort of like play around, you have a lot of freedom, you, you sort of hack stuff a, a lot, and then usually nothing happens. It's not for money or anything like that. But in my experience, it's very interesting because a lot of the stuff that I have, I've hacked on early somehow later in the future uh, they turn out to be useful on the professional uh, level so there is like this connection you know like wait i already know how to do this but i learned it because it was interesting so i'm just gonna apply this at my regular job you know so uh, it's not all of the stuff but most of them so why kika is special is because i i think it follows this the and hacker spaces in general the way i understand them is you know just like gather drink a lot of beers, hack around stuff. Something may happen, something may not happen. Don't know, doesn't matter, just go and hack stuff and do it for the fun, you know. There is no expectation of like shipping a project, shipping a product in a, in a time, sort of like a timeline. Uh, there, there, there are no bounds, basically. It's like, I, I like to think as the art of, you know, programming uh, or art of software engineering. Right, right. Well, barring the beer, it's about learning and exploration for learning and exploration's sake, and there's exactly. a huge value in that. I agree with that. Uh, switching gears a bit back to something you said earlier, uh, you've been published a couple of times so far, and you're also a writer, one could say, and you also happen to be active in academia. So, what can you tell us about that? Yes, um, so uh, I think 
the first book that I authored was in 2018 and it was the book about Idris, Gentle Introduction to Dependent Types with, Types with Idris. And it's a special book to me because it was my first book and I put a lot of effort into it because it was self-published using the KDP platform from Amazon, uh, Kindle Digital Publishing. And it's like this platform where you have a lot of freedom but then you know, at the same time, you don't want to just like publish anything, right? So I had this experience of um, trying to mail random persons, trying to meet new people that would be interested in the topic and sort of like, you know, uh, ask them to, to take a look at the book, provide some comments. Uh, so one of the reviewers is actually, you know, Neil Michel, who, who is uh, very uh, active in the uh haskell uh environment uh, the haskell ecosystem environment uh he's a haskeller and he's implemented a ton of stuff i think uh, he implemented hackage which is the haskell um, package uh url but uh you know you sort of meet like this person he has the same interest with you and he's interested in reading your work so that's that was my biggest my most interesting thing then the other the other um you know um a reviewer is Nathan Bloomfield. He's actually a co-worker of mine. He has a PhD in math. So it was really interesting to sort of like, you know, talk about all of this stuff. And uh, But as for writing the book itself, it was like this, uh, I want to, s I, I will call it a selfish um, thing to do for a lack of a better word. And selfish in the sense that, um, so right, I'm learning like this type systems, programming languages, all of them. And there is like no single place when you can learn about, you know, the, so dependent types has a lot of stuff before you get to it. You know, it, it builds on another system, which builds on another system. And then you get to the bottom, which is the, the plain lambda calculus, the untyped lambda calculus. And I'm like, so there are a lot of tutorials. There are a lot of Wikipedia pages. There is IRC, Freenode back then, uh, the Haskell channel. And you sort of like learn all of this stuff by asking, by doing research. And I'm like, wait, so I'm already blogging all of this stuff that I'm, that, that I have learned. I just can, you know, take out the blogs and compile them in a, in a, you know, sort of like a natural flow and, you know, just write a book and find reviewers and, you know, edit it, do whatever it takes and just like, you know, self publish it. And, um, that happened. And, uh, I'm really happy about the first one because even to this day, I'm getting like, you know, crazy mails. Like I know, for example, that it's used in one university in, uh, Indiana. I think it was a lot of random people messaging me, you know, they find it very useful and I'm like, you know, I'm so happy. Um, and it's not about the thing that it's, it's not about boosting your ego, but it's more of like, uh, you did something which you found useful and now somebody else is finding it useful as well so it's like you know you 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 get like this um good feeling that uh something that you did actually affected other people as well in a positive is in a positive way so th this feeling is is really and you know besides of course like the the usual stuff you know boosting your writing skills your reading skills your research skills all of these are sort of a prerequisite for for writing a book and then yeah, the second book, uh, Introducing Blockchain with Lisp, it was kind of like, so I'm like uh, with my family in this uh, small town in Greece for, for a summer break, of course, with my laptop. And there was this, um, I think it was like this hype with Bitcoin achieved a lot of, you know, uh, like this very, very high value. And people were just like hyping and I'm like, what is Bitcoin? I, I, I don't want to invest in it. You know, I, I don't even know what it is, but I just want, I, I'm interested in like, the, the, the mechanics the, the engine what what what's what is bitcoin so of course you know I've, I've always like been saying to myself the best way to learn something is to just like implement it yourself write it and you know it will become much 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 better much clearer you, you will sort of have once you write it down it sort of crystallize crystallizes that's that's the effect that i'm getting with writing so i'm like okay you know i'm writing this sort of uh very small project uh it was done in dr racket which is like uh, previously known as plt scheme so it's like a lisp um you know di dialect and i'm writing this software which has support for peer-to-peer -peer, has support for blocks for doing transactions for doing all the ha you know hashing encryption decryption all those bits which you know of course took some time to do research and i'm just like you know hey okay i know what 
blockchain is right now. I have a good idea and I'm just like publishing this to GitHub and I, I don't care what happens. And so after a while I'm, I'm getting this email from APRES, which is the publishing company that publishes the second book and they, they're like, oh, well, we saw your GitHub project. Uh, are you interested in publishing a book about it? You know, explaining. So this was like pure code. It has a very small readme. And, you know, it's sort of, you sort of had to go through the code and try to understand it yourself. So, you know, not, not very beginner friendly. And I'm like, well, you know, why not? I'm just, you know, it's, it's another experience. So first book was self-published. This book is, you know, already talking to a publisher, which is to, to, to a degree more serious than the first book. And, you know, at this point, yeah, I'm just accepting it and, you know, trying to figure out the chapters and all of those bits and yeah, that book went out. Um, and then the third book also published with A-Press uh, is very similar to the first book about uh, Daf Daphne, another programming language. So the book is called, the third book is called Introducing Software Verification with Daphne. And uh, it's, you know, sort of like giving the, the tools and the ideas that Daphne is used. So Daphne is a program, another programming language from Microsoft that allows you to, soft, um, to verify your software correctly by using um, mathematical tools. So sort of, you know, ma mathematics and programming is what, what's always been interesting for me. And um, I, I started digging into Daphne and learn, learned it's sort of like systems, how it's, how it's working. And sort of uh you know as as i'm learning these bits i'm explaining them in the book cool cool we're almost an hour in and we sort of have to like start closing this thing up uh i wanted to ask what are you currently working on what are the things that excite you currently that you would like to share with our audience and where can they follow you because you sound very interesting and you produce very interesting content in general so if you would like to share with us all of that yeah, so my current interests, yeah, like what you said, Academy, I started working as a part-time assistant back in March and um, December, at the end of December, this December will be my last, uh, you know, uh, sort of collaboration with them. Uh, and of course, I, I won't get too de deep into that, but sort of the DLDR is, you know, I just wanted to, to, to get like another experience to see what it is like to work in Academia what it is like to teach, uh, what it is like to, you know, set like a classroom, all of those bits. But of course, you know, then you get like the usual academia politics and all of those stuff, which uh, were not impressive. So I'm, uh, you know, I, I, I resigned from the from the position. So, uh, so several more days and end of December will be the end of it. Uh, but it was a great experience and it's very related to my current interests, which is uh, more focus on DevEx. Uh, I have, I'm very thankful to Automatic for even giving me the opportunity to, to learn and to improve because, you know, it's like somebody is paying you to, to, to learn something that's interesting to you. So, all right. And... Um, so teaching all of that in academia was a great experience because right now, like I said, at Automatic, we, you know, we spend uh, our time in DevEx with hiring, with uh, uh, developer mentorship, uh, other tools, uh, to, uh, internal tooling, uh, process improvements, see how we can help other teams be more productive, uh, you know, try to understand what a team does, uh, you know, from, from like a bird view perspective and see if something can be improved. Um, all of those bits and uh, yes, as to where I can be found, so I have a I have a blog uh, blog uh, blog po um, my own blog uh, space on WordPress. It's uh, b o b o r zero so borrow with a zero uh, dot wordpress dot com. Uh, all of my content is there. Um, you know uh, everything that you and I discussed today can be found there in sort of like written form. Um, I also have a Twitter account, uh, LinkedIn, but I have to admit I'm not very active uh, on those social uh, media networks. Um, of course, I, I do open them, but it's you know it's like uh, I, I I think I spend most of my time on my on my blog and just writing stuff, crystallizing ideas in my head, and uh, keep keep learning new stuff. Nice. That sounds cool. We'll leave uh, links to all of that in our show notes. So with that, I would like to thank Voro for being a guest on our first ever episode of the CodePub podcast. And I would like to thank you for listening. Thank you, Voro.
Thank you. It's been a pleasure attending here. And uh, like I said in the beginning, uh, really looking forward to many more uh, podcast episodes. And uh, hopefully we we, we, we get to, to, to the point where we have a, a lot of uh, new and interesting uh, you know, people to listen to, uh, especially in this part of the of the world where, you know, it's not as, as uh, popular in the other parts. I would say. So, yeah, thank you very much. Peace out and see you next time.